Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for June 24th, 2019. I'm your host, Jeanette Dapheide. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is the Trusted CI framework toward practical, comprehensive cybersecurity programs with Craig Jackson and Bob Cowles. Craig and Bob are members of Trusted CI. Craig is the Program Director for the Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, also known as CACR. And Bob is a Senior Fellow at CACR and the Head of Bright Light Information Security. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions um, using the chat box. And some of you have found it already, but if you click on the chat icon, you can pull up the chat screen. And because we are introducing a new topic to our community, we are going to collect questions during the presentation, but we will be asking them at the end, just in case some of the questions that come up are answered later in the presentation. And with that, I will hand things over to Craig. Craig, welcome. Thanks very much, Jeanette. And, and uh, good morning or good day to everybody. Um, yeah, so we're going to uh, talk about the Trusted CI framework, uh, something that uh, we've been working on for a number of years uh, here at uh, the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. Um, we're shifting it uh, into a, uh, a serious reboot and uh, development and community engagement uh, mode on this um, and are excited to, to give you all an overview of where we're going. Um, you all know uh, Trusted CI, uh, both Bob and I uh, uh, have uh, been a part of this for a number of years, very proud to, to be with uh, such a good looking group. Um, just a quick outline, um, I'm going to talk for just a few minutes about the concept of cybersecurity programs. Um, it's uh, pretty basic, but we find it very important to, to, uh, to give that context. Then Bob is going to get into the nitty gritty about the Trusted CI framework. And we're hoping we, we reserve plenty of time uh, for your questions that you'll be, uh, that you'll, that uh, Jeanette will be collecting as we go along. Okay, cybersecurity programs. Um, what is a cybersecurity program? This, this is the definition that we've been using. Um, a cybersecurity program is a structured approach to develop, implement, and maintain a productive organizational environment with appropriate levels of information related risk. Um, breaking that down a little bit, some things that a cybersecurity cyber program are not. It's not a plan. It's not just words on, on paper. Um, it's not a project because projects have, uh, are supposed to have pretty clear uh, beginning, middles, and ends. And it's, it's not just a set of controls that an organization implements. It's really a living, breathing thing that programmatically sits as part of the organization and, and uh, lives through that organization's life cycle. So on that last bullet point, this is something that we frequently uh, feel like we, we come up against uh, in, our, in, our, um, in our operational lives in cybersecurity and in our role of, of uh, developing guidance. Is a cybersecurity program more than just a control set? Yes. So this is an uh, official uh, definition of controls. Controls are administrative, technical, or physical safeguards or countermeasure, countermeasures operating within the environment to address a risk. Um, a cybersecurity control set describes a group of controls that might be appropriate or required for a particular information uh, environment. So examples of those are the CIS controls, the Australian Essential 8, uh, NIST Special Publication 853, um, and a number of other uh, uh, NIST control sets that are out there. The list goes on. Um, these are important, uh, but there is more to a program than just uh, a set of controls that you, you seek to implement. So why approach cybersecurity programmatically? Why, why go through the, the effort of developing this living, breathing thing that is your program? 
Um, a, cybersecurity is dynamic, complex, and multidisciplinary. I don't think that's controversial. Um, cybersecurity takes time and resources, not just money, but human resources effort to address competently. And cybersecurity is always relevant, regardless of what phase your project or your organization is in, whether you're, you're standing something up for the first time under construction or well into uh, the life of that organization. And approaching cybersecurity programmatically allows for, for a few things. Um, a big one is prioritization. You know, you, you, those of you who actively practice uh, or work in the cybersecurity field know that uh, your, your programmatic effort, all those controls, they don't just pop into being overnight. Um, it takes time and it, it requires prioritization. And related to that, it allows for good project management. Right? You can have multiple security projects uh, and ongoing activities live um, across time and space to make progress toward, uh, toward an appropriate level of maturity. So with that, I'm going to turn the, the mic over to my close colleague, Bob Coles, uh, to talk to you about the Trusted CI framework and how it frames uh, developing and maintaining cybersecurity programs. Bob. Okay, next. So the motivations for doing a framework is that the cybersecurity community generally lacks a minimum standard for cybersecurity programs. So the existing frameworks that, uh, that Craig mentioned tend to be very expensive and practical to really implement because they're just so detailed. And uh, the other problem is that many auditors, especially leaders and policymakers, confuse the implementing a bunch of controls with actually having a good cybersecurity program next. So the goal of this framework is to have, we want to have a, an initial framework implementation guide oriented toward research centers and medium to large uh, science infrastructure projects. And we wanted to put other frameworks and controls in some sort of perspective so that the community has some sort of minimum standard for a competent mission-focused cybersecurity program. Uh, we would like to have um, early adoption by a diverse set of stakeholder institutions and achieve acceptance by NSF project leads and CIOs and CISOs. Next. So the architecture consists of, uh, we we fought over a, a 16 concise clear minimum standards, musts, for a cybersecurity program organized under uh, four pillars. These are based upon cybersecurity best practices and evidence of what works. We emphasize the program uh, and, and, not the, and not the controls. And we would accept, expect these uh, musts to have very infrequent updates. Uh, then we would produce uh, framework implementation guides. Uh, the first one, as I said, being for the large, large uh, facilities and uh, and, uh, and and major uh, major NSF facilities oriented toward them. The guidance would be vetted and tailored to the open science community. Uh, we would have pointers to the very best resources and yearly updates to the framework implementation guides. Next. So the pillars, four pillars, mission alignment, which includes information classification, asset inventory, and external requirements. Governance, that's a big one. Roles and responsibilities, policy, risk acceptance, and program evaluation resources, people, budget, services, and tools. And then finally, we get to controls, the thing that uh, a lot of frameworks uh, emphasize. Next. So the framework must, under uh, mission alignment, our very first one, you have to have a cybersecurity program that is tailored to the organization's mission. It doesn't just stand alone out there with a whole bunch of things that, that people do, it has to be oriented toward the mission of the organization. 
the organizations, however, must identify and account for all the stakeholders and various requirements that you have, whether they're legal requirements like, like uh, HIPAA or, or some other confidential, confidentiality requirements. Organizations must maintain an inventory of their information assets and they must have a structure for classifying information. Uh, next, let's go into more detail on the mission, mission alignment uh, information classification. Next. So information, as you know, has varying degrees of value, sensitivity, and protection requirements. So these are key factors in analyzing how you're going to, uh, your, what is going to be the impact of security incidents. Think about the, the typical CIA triad that we always talk about, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. These apply differently to different kinds of, of, of data. And science organizations have a different level of, of concern. Typically, for instance, availability uh, requires different controls than confidentiality. And, and availability and integrity are often more important in an open science environment. Now, if you think about, if you have like three different categories for each one, three times three times three, that's 27. Uh, as an example, University of California has collapsed the uh, confidentiality and integrity into four levels, and then they have four levels associated with uh, availability in their latest, uh, and their latest proposed way of, of, of classifying information. Uh, next. So you need to develop a policy around the core procedures regarding how you treat those different categories of information in terms of the creation, processing, transmission, storage, and disposal of that, of, of that information. And then you determine the protection requirements for each category. So now you can group those things. Uh, and so, so you, you know, once you determine the, the classification of the data, that tells you basically what kinds of controls need to apply to that kind of, uh, to that kind of data. Next. So under governance, this is a big one. And we spent a lot of time on this because this is one place where uh, organizations often uh, kind of fall down in their cybersecurity program. Uh, you have to involve leadership in the decision making. You must have roles and responsibilities for risk acceptance. You need to have a lead role with responsibility to advise and provide services. This is what, you know, normally the CISO. Notice they advise and provide services to the organization. They don't, they don't say, they're not, they're not in the business of saying no. Uh, organizations must ensure that cybersecurity program extends to everybody with access or control over it. So that's your users, your service providers, everybody. Uh, you have to have a way of, of instituting policies and that includes develop, adopt, explain, follow, enforce, and revise. We call this the defer. And there's, there's sort of a, uh, an issue a lot of times with people that develop and adopt and then somehow never explain, follow, or enforce policies. So you have to go, have to be able to do the whole, whole uh, cycle there. And organizations must evaluate and refine their cybersecurity program. Next. So one detail I wanted to talk about was risk acceptance. Next. So risk acceptance is typically done when the cost of mitigating the risk exceeds the expected benefit. So you need to have that explicitly performed by decision makers, uh, not just the cybersecurity people. And the cybersecurity people are responsible for informing them of the residual risk options for risk reduction. Uh, parameters change, the, the different threats change, um, technology changes, new programs come into being. So 
so you have to have to review this periodically as the uh, as the parameters change. Notice that accepting a risk does not reduce the actual risk. Next. So I, I thought about this diag. I was thinking about this diagram or something like it for a long time, and finally I went to a conference, and there was a guy from Siemens who actually had uh, had come up with it. And the idea is that as you drive the risk down, the cost of cybersecurity goes up. And the cost not only of cybersecurity, but the cost to the whole organization goes up. And so somewhere in the middle, there's this ability to innovate that, that reaches a peak. And so that's kind of the sweet spot that you're trying for. So you, would, you want to provide, like I say, provide guardrails, not barriers in, the, in terms of the cybersecurity. Next. So a risk acceptor then is someone who weighs the risk against project mission and accepts residual risk. You have to have a broad view of the project and, and the ability to control information assets responsible for the outcome of accepting those risks. So, for example, management, a, a PI or a technical lead would be a risk acceptor. The cybersecurity lead is responsible for the implementation of any controls and gauging the residual risk. You have to translate those technical issues into management speak. So you help the risk acceptors make informed decisions. And uh, examples of this would be IT security professional or a senior technical uh, person. Next. So under resources, um, the framework must, so of course organizations have to have uh, adequate resources to mitigate the risks that are deemed unacceptable. You have to have a cybersecurity budget you have to have personnel devoted to cybersecurity. And you must identify external cybersecurity resources to support the cybersecurity program. Next. So we're going to talk about those external services and tools. Next. Um, so you have to give careful consideration to the following areas. Uh, what kind of service you're expecting from the provider, what kind of resources you have to allocate to use the product. You know, focus on product vendors and services that are already communicative, responsive, responsive and project specific. Have procedures for mitigating any new emergent security issues. You know, what are the, what are the, the big, problems is, when, for instance, when an antivirus uh, software or something like that actually has a hole in it that allows, a, uh, allows an attack. So how you manage these, these relationships has a substantial effect on the risk and costs associated with information security. Now, what I always like to say is that uh, these external tools that you can get, you know, whether they be things like an antivirus program or a or a uh, uh, intrusion detection system or something like that, a lot of times they can increase the amount of personnel resource that's required. You know, if you have an intrusion detection system, it takes uh, a lot of work to get that tuned properly. You have to deal with all of the alerts that come in and, uh, and it can significantly increase the staffing requirements. Um, services would hopefully decrease uh, at potentially added expense, but would decrease the, uh, the personnel requirements because they provide actual sort of like, they may monitor the IDS for you or something like that. So you have to be very careful. Uh, next slide. So, you know, the idea is Beware of shiny objects. It's really tempting, uh, particularly because a lot of times management has, oh, we have one-time funds for you to buy something. Here, go out and buy this. 
uh, but no, we're not going to give you an uh, increase in personnel to actually be trained on this, uh, on this tool and to uh, use it effectively. So examples are, you know, sophisticated log collection and analysis software, things like Splunk or something like that are very, very powerful, but require a significant amount of training to be able to actually use them. You know, fancy firewalls or firewall managers with advanced capabilities are in the same sort of category or intrusion detection, intrusion, uh, intrusion uh, protection uh, software. Generates alerts on seeing suspicious activity. The first time you install it and turn it on, you'll be flooded with things and it requires significant tuning to sort of get it down to where it actually uh, alerts on real suspicious activity for your site. So the staff training and resources required to effectively use these products are significant. And you know, you get management okay for the one time purchase or something like that. And and then the the uh, tool sits around while you figure out, uh, you know, who has the time to deal with this thing. Next slide. So the framework must for controls. And it's sort of surprising in a sense that this is the smallest group because this is the uh, one that most a lot of the quote frameworks unquote, out there uh, actually emphasize. What we say is that organizations must adopt a baseline control set and then you select and deploy alternative or alternate additional controls as, uh, as warranted in your particular situation. Next. So let's talk about selecting a baseline control set. Next. So one guide that we found really useful was uh, uh, primarily authored by John Gilligan. He's a former uh, Air Force CIO um, on called the Economics of Cybersecurity. So what he wrote is that you know there's very limited quantitative data that's that's really valuable. A lot of people like to pretend there's quantitative data. Uh, but it's really just sort of like, you know, well, high, medium, or low. You can't really put a, a number between one and 10 on, the, on say, for instance, what's the, the, uh, what's the kind of threat do you have or what kind of risk do you have? Um, most cyber attacks are unsophisticated because, why? Because they work. So, you know, standard phishing uh, emails or something like that. The, those those are uh, in large to a large extent the, the the thing that is most often seen. And total protection is uneconomical. So so you can't you can't keep everybody out unless you you know like take the computers and bury them in concrete. Um, so the idea is. You focus on the low cost, high impact interventions. We call those the gray pigeons. So because, the, because they have, uh, there are so many of them, you just need to reduce the, the noise. You prioritize defenses against these common unsophisticated attacks. And then you emphasize targeted defenses against the high sophistication, high criticality attacks. And then there are <clears throat> uh, high sophistication, low criticality attacks that you just accept. Next. So this is the, the idea here. So uh, with, the sophisticated, with the unsophisticated attacks, you basically implement the, the comprehensive baseline of security controls. This takes care of what we call the what we call the gray pigeons, and the the primary noise level that you have. Then, once you've done that, then you can deploy some targeted advanced security controls associated with the 
the things that high, well, primarily attacked your mission. So those are in the upper right. And then for the low risk, um, for the low risk, very sophisticated attacks, you just have to accept those. It's unfeasible, infeasible to, uh, to go after those. Next slide. So what's a good baseline control set to adopt? The CIS controls, also known as the critical security controls for the SAMS top 20, are something that we really promote that people take a close look at. They're prioritized. Uh, Pescatori, back in uh, a few years ago, said in the back to basics, focus on the first six critical controls as a, as a way to start. Um, with version 7.1, uh, CIS has actually uh, provided some additional prioritization of their controls. And, uh, and so as you go through and look at the 20 controls and, and the, the details in each of those controls, uh, they have three levels of priority that they'll assign in terms of if you're you know a small or have, don't have much in the way of resource uh, here's the things that you should implement first um, so these controls were developed uh, based upon you know a lot of feedback from people actually in involved in cybersecurity in fact in the history of this the NSA was actually involved they're updated frequently almost annually Lots of lots of controversy, lots of discussion goes into uh, developing these controls. Uh, they're tested and provable. The, so the plaintiffs in, in, in the uh, in, in legal terms and regulators will prefer this. So and so do technologists, engineers, and scientists. And the CIS controls, in terms of a, a legal sense, have a potential becoming the de facto standard for what is reasonable security. So, you know, when a, when a case legal case comes up, you know, question is, do you have you had reasonable security? Have you performed adequately? And if you've adopted the CIS controls, that has may become the de facto legal standard. Next slide. So what are these controls? Well, the first six that were talked about in terms of what you need to do to primarily get started and focus on are the inventory of devices, inventory of software, uh, doing vulnerability assessment and remediation. Yeah, patch. Uh, control and use of administrative privileges. Uh, this includes things like uh, using two-factor authentication. Uh, having a secure configuration for uh, hardware and software. And then monitor your system so that you know what's going on. What is the, what are the, the normal behaviors of people and, and devices so that you can de uh, detect what's potentially abnormal behavior in the sign of a sign of an attacker. Uh, next. Okay, thank you, Bob. Um, that that completes the the overview of the the architecture and the basics, the foundation of the framework that we're working on. Um, something uh, the, sort of the last substantive slide, and I won't read this whole thing to you, but take a screenshot or or, or come back to the um, the recording if if you'd like. But you know, the, we're really pushing to turn the development uh, effort for the framework into a, a very inclusive community effort. Um, we've gotten as far as we have with great collaboration uh, across uh, the, the NSF science community with our engagements, with our summit, with large facility security team and so on. Um, and, and we know that if this framework is going to be helpful, useful, and successful for this community, um, it's, it's going to involve you all. 
Um, so if you're interested in being involved in the advisory group that we're standing up, um, or you know, interested in becoming uh, an early adopter and having a, a more, um, more intensive uh, interaction with us as we, um, as we move toward developing that first framework implementation guide, uh, please feel free uh, to reach out. You can always contact info at trustedci.org or if you've got our contact information, reach out to me, reach out to Jim Basney, Vaughn Welch, Bob Coles. Uh, we're listening and very interested in, in building a, a diverse group here uh, to advise us and, uh, and uh, be involved along the way. So uh, with that said, I would say, I think we're uh, ready, Jeanette, for questions if folks have them. Yeah, so why don't I get through my business quickly so that we can let, give some people some time to type. So first of all, uh, we, we would like your feedback on our webinars uh, on this presentation or a suggestion of topics of future presentations. And so here in the chat box, I am posting a link to a Google form, which is a, our feedback form. So please fill that out, tell us what you think, and uh, use the comment section if you have any other topics you'd like to hear more about. And uh, could you advance the slide, please, Craig? Um, we have a few uh, updates, a few save the dates. One of them is uh, PERC. Um, PERC is the Practice and Experience in Advanced Research Computing Conference. This is going to be in Chicago. Uh, if you're attending PERC, we will have a booth. We are presenting a workshop. Uh, we're presenting a panel, our, our paper. Uh, so if you want to meet with members of Trusted CI and, and speak with us, you can come and find us at PERC. And more information about PERC is at perc19.perc.org. Uh, next slide, please. Also, our Cybersecurity Summit is coming up in October. So if you would like to come to our summit, it will be in San Diego this year. Uh, you can find more information about it at trustedci.org summit. We also announced right at the end of last week that our call for presentations is open. So please go to our website to find out more about how to uh, submit a proposal. And next slide, please. And uh, to view, view presentations, uh, to join our announcements mailing list or submit requests to present, you can visit us at trustedci.org slash webinars. Our next webinar is going to be July 22nd at 11 a.m. Eastern. The topic is campus infrastructure for micro scale privacy conscious data driven planning and our speaker is Jason Waterman. And I think that covers all of my news that I wanted to get through. So let's move on to questions here. We've got one uh, question. Will the framework uh, cover be flexible to all different compliance levels? We see, uh, for example, will it be um, will it impact uh, NIST 800 153, et cetera? Yeah, uh, great question. Thanks, Tim. Um, the, the answer is yes. Uh, so in general, yep, uh, also ITAR and CUI, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, as, uh, as Bob noted, uh, the, the, the way that, there are a couple of, of musts that are, are particularly relevant. One is taking account of external requirements. Uh, that's under the missions pillar. Um, and, and the other is selecting uh, baseline control set. Um, so if you're an organization that is required to adopt, um, say, 800-171, with regard to the controlled unclassified information that you're receiving or, or producing. Um, you, one, it's good to know that that's a requirement that's built into your contract that you uh, need to address. Um, and two, you have a, um, a decision to make about whether you take that uh, control set, whether it's 800-171 or one of the 853 baselines or whatever, as part of your overarching baseline control set. Um, I think uh, without getting into all the ups and downs, ins and outs, you could imagine a very reasonable uh, research organization deciding, hey, we're only going to 
worry about 800-171 compliance when it comes to our controlled and classified information. Other than that, maybe we want our baseline control set to be something, um, uh, you, you know, more prioritized or more tailored in some fashion. You could all, you know, uh, similarly, or, or the, the flip side of that coin is you could be an organization that decides, you know what, we've got to deal with this 800-171 thing. Uh, you know, even though it's focused on confidentiality, it, it, there's a bunch of good controls in there. And, uh, you know, maybe we adopt that as our overarching baseline. But certainly the framework is designed to, um, uh, to be able to accommodate those requirements when they come um, and, you know, put them in perspective, right? U ultimately, the Trusted CI framework is about the mission of the organization and finding that right balance. Did that, uh, did that get, get your question covered? Yes, thank you, he says. Okay, great. So um, we still have uh, plenty of time if anyone else would like to submit a question. Uh, so one, one other thing is that, you know, we spend a lot of time and a lot of the, the musts in the framework uh, are around governance. And this is, this is really an important area that a lot of places uh, uh, sort of overlook in terms of uh, having a good cybersecurity program. And so regardless of what you pick for your uh, baseline control set, you really have to have those governance functions in place in terms of how do you accept risk? I mean, even if you're going to pick 171, uh, you can't you can't address all those controls at one time. So you're going to have to you're going to have the residual risk and some unacceptable risks that that you know the typical what term is plan of action and milestones a poem. You've got to have a plan for how you're going to address that risk, that unacceptable risk in the future. Um, but that can't be decided just, uh, just by the, you know, the cybersecurity people. It's got to involve leadership because they've got to accept the fact that they, they're going to have to have resources out in the future to deal with those and how you're going to address them. In a lot of ways, <clears throat> uh, the other big issue is that the cybersecurity people, uh, for cybersecurity people, they can't be in the position of just saying no, they have to come up with creative ways of addressing the risk. There are lots of times when there are many, uh, many different ways to skin the cat, if you will. And so if you're talking with somebody who is responsible for something, being creative in terms of how you can mitigate the risk, what different kinds of controls uh, can you put in place that will help reduce the risk to an acceptable level is, is very important. And ultimately, it's up to the person responsible for a particular resource uh, to decide, you know, is this an acceptable risk or not? If the cybersecurity person disagrees with that decision, then they can go to management to potentially overrule that. Um, but that's that's sort of a, a a difficult decision at times, but but maybe necessary. But at least if management then up decides that yes, no, that, that's that's the uh, that's the correct decision, then okay, they've made that decision. Doesn't mean they won't hang you out to dry when the, <laughs> when, the when the when the bad stuff happens, but at least you know, they made the decision. So it looks not, like this, oh, not, to ahead, present, not to present an entirely jaded uh, perspective, but <laughs> uh, the um, t Tim Hudson uh, followed up and he said, my concern is with different project. My concern is with the, the fact that different projects require uh, different types of compliance, looking to use the framework to be the baseline that works with all hopefully. Yeah, that, that, 
uh, Tim, that's exactly uh, one of the purposes of the Trusted CI framework. Um, what I would argue is that, you know, if you look through those musts, um, I, I think that in, by design, they are supposed to be fairly non-controversial, right? These, these are supposed to be truly the basics, but a comprehensive set of the basics. And what I would argue is that an organization that uh, takes each of these 16 musts and addresses those uh, soundly will, will be better prepared uh, than, uh, than other organizations to deal with the fact that they have uh, compliance requirements that, you know, existing compliance requirements are the next thing that comes down the road. So, um, you know, I uh, truly do hope that this, this provides a baseline that cuts across all of those uh, scenarios. Sorry, I cut you off, Jeanette. No, that's, that's fine. I, I was going to read this reply too. So um, with that, do we have uh, any more questions that people want to ask? Also, uh, Craig, you're available for maybe a, a private uh, direct email. Uh, is that correct? Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. So, well, why don't we uh, wrap things up then? Uh, thank you very much, Bob and Craig, for presenting. Uh, for those of you who are watching, um, I will be sending around the recording of this video and a copy of the slides on, um, to our mailing list. So if you wanted to share this with uh, a colleague, we highly encourage you to do that. And uh, with that, I will say thank you very much, uh, Craig and Bob. Any final comments? Oh, thanks for having us. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all. Great, and it looks like uh, pe the people are responding. Thank you, <laughs> sounds like a great effort. Thank you all. Okay, well, have a good day, everyone, and uh, we'll be in contact with the uh, video and slides.